Come on down to Florida, bring your camera. You might not even need your long lenses. We have lots of wildlife waiting for you. Hi there, Spencer here again. Thanks for joining me again in another little photo adventure. I've been getting a lot of questions on the YouTube channel about people who are thinking about getting into large format or might have just got into it and have some questions about some uh, things that you might want to consider purchasing, what's, what's worth spending your money on, what may not be worth spending your money on. So hopefully I'll be able to help with some of that. I'm out here in one of my offices today, so this is a really great park. I've only been out here once before. This is called the Walton Ranch Preserve. It's in, you might as well say, Northport, Florida. So a little bit inland. We're not near, eh, we're about maybe, well, we're probably close to maybe half hour, 45 minutes from the coast, uh, the Gulf of Mexico. So it's kind of nice to be out here. It's nice and quiet. I'm always looking for a nice, quiet place to come and do these videos when we don't have a lot of people around so it makes it a little bit easier so yeah so anyway so we'll kind of get into what i bought what's worked for me and maybe some things that i would have done differently if i was starting over so first things first you have to have some way to carry all of your stuff now because i'm shooting eight by ten uh, when i was researching different backpacks or way i was going to carry this stuff uh, the best thing I could find was this F64 backpack, and I got this from B&H. Now, nobody's telling me, paying me to tell you this stuff. I'm telling you what I literally spent my money on. I'm um, not being sponsored by anybody for this stuff, so, um, you know, hopefully it will help you and give you an honest review. So the one thing I do like about this backpack, it does, it did come with compartments in the middle of it, and I took all that out, and this part down here is big enough for an 8x10 camera. Uh, you could put a 4x5 camera in here, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. But basically this was built mainly for uh, 8x10, I believe. And these pockets here on the side, these, these came with, I got two of these pockets here. And these are the right size for 4x5 film holders. So it comes with two, you could buy two more and then strap them on the sides to give you a total of four if you needed them. Um, obviously my film holders are not 4x5, so I've got a little bit different setup for that, which I'll show you here in a second. Uh, the only thing is, because I'm a little bit bigger than the average bear, <laughs> if you've seen my other videos, um, the straps. This has the, what goes around, obviously around your shoulders, but then um, what I found is this part that goes around your waist was a little bit short for me, because apparently I had one too many donuts. So. <laughs> Uh, my wife was very kind that she, we went to Joanne Fabric or you, know, you can find that pretty much any fabric store and got some of this like ripstop nylon material and she did a really nice job sewing the two, the existing together with this. So then this extended the belt out so I can easily get this around me. Uh, you can take the belt, I don't know how well this will show in the video, but this belt does come out of this if you want. But let me tell you, it is really on there with Velcro. I did take it off once and um, haven't really needed to. So it's very comfortable, even though th this loaded, as you see it right now. So I got the camera, the film holders, lens, all the stuff you're gonna see come out of this um, is 30 pounds. And that, that's, that could be a lot of weight. So, but I found that I've carried this all day. If you haven't seen my, um, I'll put a link to it, the um, Florida Flywheelers, uh, video that was last year I carried this for about six hours straight no problem so that that is quite comfortable once you get it on just getting it on getting it off obviously getting the weight up and over is uh, a little bit of a challenge sometimes but it was overall it's pretty comfortable I've no, no complaints about it um, it again has this nice big foam handle here in the front so you can grab this if you just need to throw it in the back of your trunk or whatever it is you're going to do that so just to kind of show you how it opens are some of the compartments. Again, on the front here, there's a safety latch here. So you just undo this. And then in here, what I have, and I won't do it all the way because I've got my, my film in here, but this is my infamous black trash bags. Uh, then there's, I've got two 8x10 film holders in here, so that holds them very comfortably. 
I have squeezed a third one in there, but it really gets kind of uh, tricky. So I probably wouldn't try to put more than two in here. And then what's nice is this will go across this belt to lock everything into place, not just your film compartment, but also when we go to unzip this, uh, the camera's underneath this. So that's pretty nice. So as far as the top compartment goes, what I have here, when we unzip this, uh, here is my compendendum hood. So for example, I, again, if you go and watch the lover's key video, and I'll put links to all this in the descriptions down below, but the lover's key uh, video is where I first tried this. And I, what, what this is, if you've never seen one of these, because these lenses don't necessarily come with a lens hood like you might be accustomed to seeing, like a DSLR or something. This actually opens up and then I can shield the lens from any kind of lens flare. And this is the wide angle version. There's two different kinds. And this is the wide angle version. It's made by Lee Filter. And it came with this case. So um, I've used it a couple times and I've been pretty happy with it. It is an investment. So depending upon the type of shooting you do, do you need it, do you not need it? Um, I found I used it and it's helped me on a couple shots. So, you know, you're putting all that effort into going out to the location, scouting, shooting, developing, and everything goes out, goes with it. Um, the last thing I want to do is not have the right piece of equipment to, uh, to get the shot. So anyway, so that's, that's the compendendum hood. And this actually came with a camera when I bought it. This is a good old fashioned cable release. It has a real cable on the inside. So it screws in. This one I think is made by Pentax, but you know, you, I think any of them, they're pretty much are pretty standard. A B&H would sell. I think they even have the Nikon version of this. Even though it's not a Pentax camera, it works with this um, cable release. So again, that was pretty minimal. If you need to buy one, they're pretty cheap. So. All right, so let's see what else we got here. Well, let's get the big guy out of here first. All right, so this is a lens wrap that I bought, uh, thinking when I got the lens, you know, I wanted to protect it somehow. So I got this lens wrap, and again, I got this from B&H. So it's just this really nice padded uh, material, and it's, I guess nature's fighting back here today. The other thing, I check, make sure I'm not in any fire ants. That's, that'd, that'd really be fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> Welcome to Florida. Uh, so anyway, so we've got this uh, padded uh, felt on the outside in this um, nice, um, it's like plasticky material, not plastic, but some kind of uh, ripstop nylon, I guess. And the, it does have Velcro on all of the edges, so that way you can get it to stick to itself. And that's all I did is bump, bump, bump. There we go, and it's pretty, pretty done. This wasn't terribly expensive. These again come in different sizes. I believe this is the large one. It's from Rugged and it says it's a GW-19-B, if that helps. So I just looked for the biggest one and that's what I bought. So here's the lens and it's already mounted on the lens board. Uh, so as far as the, this is the only lens that I have, it's what came with the camera when I bought it. It's a Nikon 300 millimeter, that's a Nikon W, excuse me, 300 millimeter 5.6. And so it's a nice hunk of glass. It does take a 95 millimeter thread on the front. Let's just kind of move this here so you guys can see. Uh, 95 millimeter thread on the front. I do have a UV filter. I bought a really good one. This one's from B&W. Um, it says it's an F-Pro 95 millimeter. Uh, I paid pretty decent money for the filter. I'm in the camp of, I like to have a UV filter because there's been times where I've stuck my lenses maybe where they don't belong, <laughs> either up against fences or um, against trees and I didn't realize it and I jammed them into the bushes, that kind of stuff. So I'd rather risk scratching the filter than the lens. And since these aren't exactly made anymore, I can't exactly call a manufacturer and say, hey, send me another one. Um, th so that, that, that's one reason. If you don't use a lens filter, then obviously don't. But uh, if you are going to use a lens filter, buy a good one. Um, when I taught my photo classes, that's what I do for partly for a living, is I teach at two colleges. Uh, they're extended li lifelong learning programs. 
And I tell my students, you know, you don't want to buy a really nice lens and then stick a $5 filter on the front of it. That's just, you're dumbing down the uh, performance of the glass. So, you know, buy, buy a decent filter. Uh, it is, this particular lens is mounted in a Copal 3 shutter. It goes from 5.6 to f64. And um, anyway, there's the back of it. So that's pretty, pretty simple. So we'll just kind of park this stuff all over here for right now. All right, let's see what else we got in here. Make sure that uh, you never know a cow or something might come up behind me. <laughs> All right, so this is my loop that I use for focusing. And this is a Wista, W-I-S-T-A loop. I believe it's a 5X. And basically I went by price on this because I heard, you know, you need a good loop to get some final, to get fine focus. So I did spend some money on this. Uh, comes a little cap, a little thing to hang around your neck when you're, you know, if you've probably seen in other videos where I've had this hanging from my neck and uh, you obviously just use that for fine focusing. So again, that's definitely what you want. If you don't want to invest the money in something like this, you could probably get a cheaper one to get started. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Again, I'm not here to sell you stuff. I'm just here to tell you what worked for me and um, maybe what I would do have done differently as we go. But all right, now believe it or not, this was one of the more harder items to find. And I've looked through my uh, garage and I finally found this one. Even at Home Depot and Walmart and Lowe's, I had a tough time finding this. And what it is, is a t measuring tape that has both inches and millimeters and centimeters on it. So why do I need this? For example, when I do my macro photography, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and I might have the bellows drawn all the way out. So now I know that's 600 millimeters because I've measured it with this. So when you have your bellows stretched out, you're going to have some light loss. And I use that app called the Reciprocity, res, Reciprocity, I got to stop drinking for lunch, Reciprocity Timer app. <laughs> Excuse me. And so what I can do is I can measure the bellows draw and then I can put that number in millimeters into the app and then it will say, oh, you need to add one more stop of light or two more stops of light. For example, I know with my setup with this lens and everything, when I'm at 600 millimeter, which is all the way out, uh, I lose two stops of light. So when I go to calculate, I need to add two more stops to get the correct exposure because the bellows are uh, apart. So anyway, so. Do you have to have one of these? And unless you're not doing macro, I really wouldn't worry about it. Um, if you're just doing landscapes or maybe even portraits, it may not be necessary. So, but you can get one of those cheap if, if you can find one. That was maybe, probably Amazon would probably be a good place for that. All right, so uh, just to show you what I'm doing here, see if we can tip this up. So there's two compartments in here and uh, the lens was in this one. Now we're pulling out of the other little compartment. So this is the ring from Leaf Filter that connects our compendendum hood. So this goes on your lens and then you screw this, or this fits on there. It's a mounting ring and that's that. So of course this was extra. But anyway, <laughs> everything's extra, right? All right, let's see what a little fun stuff we got in here. No, just a couple more things. Okay, so I have an external light meter. Some people use their phone and you can get the app. Uh, I think it's a free app called Light Meter, which makes sense. Uh, some people said that works really well for them. 10 years ago, when I was getting into commercial photography for magazines, I was told you have to have a light meter. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So you have to have a light meter. Okay, so I went to the camera store, local camera store, before I knew about uh, B&H and some of these other ones. And I say, I need a light meter. And they just grinned from ear to ear. And this is what they sold me. This is a Sekonic, L758DR, Digital Master. I think this thing would put man on the moon. Um, <laughs> it does way more than I need. Uh, one of the things about this particular meter is it has the Pocket Wizard module built in, so if you're doing a studio setup, you could pop your flashes uh, remotely with this. Uh, I believe this also works with um, film. As far as film, I'm talking about movies and things like that. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this. But the big thing about this particular meter is it does have the incidence here, but you can also do the spot metering here on the side. So you look through here and then you can look at something off in the distance and get a reading, which is kind of nice. So this is what I use simply because I had it already. But 
yeah, when we get to the recommendations, um, we'll, we'll talk about that. All right. That meter takes these special batteries. This is a, it says Energizer 123 batteries. I guess that makes it easy to remember, right? Uh, they're three volt, and I got these at Walmart. So that's, I keep those in, it'd be kind of tough. I guess you could use a Sunny 16 rule if you're, if it's like it is right now, and you just need to um, get a rough exposure. Film can be pretty forgiving. And I got a quarter in here, just in case I get lost and I need to call someone. No, just kidding. <laughs> I don't carry change, so why do I have this? On one of my tripods, uh, it has a, th a thick screw head on it, and it's got the, it's not the, obviously the, the Phillips, it's the straight head. So rather than carry a screwdriver around, I have this quarter, and I just use this as my screwdriver, if you want to call it that, and it's simple and easy. Yeah, it works. So anyway, that's, that's why, I, why we have a quarter in there. Okay, maybe we'll get the big stuff out of here next, and then uh, we'll work on the pockets. So I'm just going to go ahead and open this up here. Now the film is on the top, so I'm just undoing the pocket that's right below it. Now, the way I have this, hopefully this will come out in the video. Let's see if I can get this a little closer to me here. I, when I was buying all this stuff, you know, somewhere I kind of had to cut some corners to save some money for other things. So... I looked at the dark claws, the, the, they have the elastic in them that go around the back end of the camera. Those are really nice and they're silver on one side and usually black on the inside. So what I did is I said, well, th those were like, I think at the time I want to say they're like a hundred bucks. Don't quote me on that, but they were, th it wasn't going to be an investment of some sort. So I went down to Joanne Fabric and I got this black. Uh, felt material and I bought like three yards of it for and plus my wife she's the queen of coupons so I think we got this for like I don't know less than ten dollars um, and it's huge so if you saw the last video which was the O for Delta 100 was blowing like crazy it's blowing a little bit today but it was blowing like crazy the like 20 mile an hour wind I had it above my head and it was like it was flying behind me that, that was that made for good TV but <laughs> anyway so what I do with this is I when I'm packing it is I put the majority of it down on the bottom of the of the uh, backpack here so if you can kind of see how this is tucked in down here since this is the bottom so it gives it a little bit of cushion and then this is the ground glass I don't have a ground glass protector for it yet so what I do is I take this when I package it and I just put this like so and then this uh, flap comes over so hopefully with all of this it will help uh, pad all of this even even more than what the backpack was designed for so anyway so this is my dark cloth it's just a piece of fabric that you can get at any clo uh, you know like a Walmart or Joanne fabric store or something like that cheap so all right so obviously here we have our camera so this is the zone 6 8x10 there is a this came with this little this little uh, handle I wouldn't trust this I'm sorry this camera is way too heavy so anyway so there's the camera so that's that I forget how heavy it is until you have to start picking it up and moving it there we go okay now what's in the pockets so I'll just open up this little side pocket here rocket blower so I don't use anything wet on my lenses uh, I found some of my students bought those pre moistened wipes that you can get uh, a lot of people use them on their sunglasses and things like that and what's happened is it put a film on the lens or on the glass and they couldn't get rid of it so I could try and stay away from those this is what I've been using this is a G-I-O-T-T-O -T -T -O. get get gato a rocket blower so uh, this was like you know, 15 20 dollars it's good to you know chase people around and irritate them so anyway <laughs> that's what i use to clean the lens and also clean out my film holders and the developing drum so i don't have any kind of i stay away from compressed air because that might have some kind of chemical residue in it so this is just plain air so we should be fine now if you ever come down this part of the woods of the United States. This is probably the most important tool you should have in your backpack.
Here it is. You don't want to miss it. Good old fashioned <laughs> mosquito repellent. And it's not bad this time of year, but come down here in June through October, they will pick you up and carry you away back to their nest and eat you alive. So this is the 40% uh, DEET version. Um, if you, again, if you want to see that video I did on the Highlands Hammock State Park. Uh, we went in there in June and started down one of the paths and my friend had some, uh, supposed to be good, well, less harmful, whatever you want to call it, mosquito repellent. We put it on and that didn't stop the mosquitoes. So I said, you know what, I'm going to put on the stuff that'll probably give me a third eye and paint my hair neon green. Um, and this stuff worked. We didn't see a mosquito for 10 miles. So uh, this one happens to be Repel. I know the Off is another big brand. So whatever you have, but if you're going to be out, you definitely want one of these done, at least in Florida. I'm sure up north as well, or wherever it is you're watching this from. So that's basically what's in this one pocket. So then we will unzip this other pocket. Let's see what we got in here. All right, I might have to turn this a bit so we can see what all we got here. Okay. These fit really nice in these little pouches. So what I have in here are my filter boxes. This is, was the UV, so that one's empty. Here's my orange and here's my red. So again, this is 95 millimeter. Um, this I believe is also from BW. Yes, BW, uh, it says 4X MRC, which I imagine is multi-coded something in their language. These, are, these were investment, but um, they really were nice. I was doing a, a large format photo down in Fort Myers about a year ago, and a gentleman had come up and was, was trying to look over the camera, and I was, you know, how you doing, that kind of stuff. By the way, here's the red one just to show you what that looks like. It's pretty. And I soon realized he didn't know English. So the thing that caught his attention is I think I was using the orange filter and since he was from Germany he noticed the B&W filters and he said you know he was telling me he was giving me a thumbs up you know it's good quality stuff uh, these these were an investment but um, it was kind of fun so somehow through the language of photography we were able to have this conversation of I was able to show him the lens and show him the uh, on the back of the camera put the dark cloth over his head so it's really great you just never know who you're going to meet with this kind of uh, this kind of hobby or profession. All right, the other thing, a couple of things I have in here is I have my little sheets, and you guys have seen these before. I made these up myself, very simple. I put the zone system on there when I got started just so I could have an idea, keep an eye, an idea of you know what was like the dark. It's pretty simple, but, and I've got, you know, highlight, shadow, average, ambient, exposed at, difference in stops, date, location, lens on film, lens, development and notes. Do you need all this stuff? Probably not. What I've gotten down to is I basically have decided after the little Ilford incident, the Ilford Delta 100, if you've not seen that video, the last one where I had the, uh, the 20 mile an hour wind, I'm going to basically going to be sticking with FP4 plus. That's done really well for me. So basically what I use this for is the date, the highlights and the shadows. Uh, then I can calculate what the dynamic range of the light is. I always shoot for the shadows, whatever that is, but then I also like to know what the highlight is so I can figure out the contrast range. So, um, and here's a pen, right? This helps to, if you're gonna write something, you gotta have a pen, and I have a couple of them in case one doesn't work, but that, that could happen. And the other thing you don't wanna forget, these are my, actually my old cards, but if you're gonna be out and about, whether you, you may not need these, but uh, always have business cards on hand, so if somebody, you meet somebody, when I was up at uh, Old Car City in Georgia back in November, I met some people from the Atlanta Camera Club. I just bumped into them out in the middle of the bushes while we were shooting cars. And I said, oh, you know, I so said, you might want to go check out my YouTube channel or Instagram. We were, we were uh, exchanging information back and forth. So here is my business cards. So basically that's all that's in that pocket. So, and again, these are built for the 4x5 uh, film holders, but I find if you do shoot 8x10 and you do have a 95 millimeter uh, filter size, 
that the holders, the whole boxes and everything will fit in here nicely. Now that I've said that, I probably jinked myself. Oh, there we go. There she goes. Okay. And again, it comes with two of these little pouches. You can get uh, two more and strap them on here. I think that's it. I think we ran out of stuff. So, okay. So what would I do different now that I've done large format for may as well say about a year and a half. I've actually been researching it for about four years and finally got up the gumption to buy the stuff about a year and a half ago. Okay, so if I was going to do this all over again, what would I do? It comes down to obviously, do you want to look at four by five? If you're, if you're getting started, four by five, eight by 10, they do make 11 by 14 cameras, um, 16 by 20. And I think they go up from there. At the end of the day, you gotta ask yourself, how big do you wanna print? So for me, I've always liked a big print. So for example, uh, I, have a, I have a gallery showing coming up. The prints themselves are 32 by 40, and then they're gonna have a four inch mat all the way around. The reason why we stuck with that size is because a sheet of mat board comes 40 by 60 from the mill. So we're able to stay with a full sheet of mat board. And then uh, I think we put either a three or four inch black frame all the way around. And of course a piece of, I like to use acrylic. Um, I don't like glass simply for the fact that most of my stuff is in very high traffic public places. And the last thing I would want is some is the picture to fall down and the glass to shatter into a million pieces and uh, accidentally harm somebody. So I don't do that. So I stick with acrylic and also for the weight. It's not for the price mainly, it's mainly for safety. Um, so that's the reason why I decided to go eight by 10. I initially looked at when I got back thinking about film again, I was like, oh, well, let me look at 35. I had scanned a lot of 35 uh, film when I was at the newspaper years ago and I, I just wasn't into it. Um, 120 is of course is bigger and better. Then I decided to look at four by five and I almost went with four by five. And what made my decision is since I really wanted to make a big print, uh, I went to B&H and I saw what film I could get every day of the week. And eight by 10, black and white, I can get every day of the week from online retailers, no problem. So that's one reason why for the print size, I'm hoping to go 80 by 100 for some other prints because I want to do massive prints. That's the reason why I go with eight by 10. If you don't see yourself doing that, I would seriously consider four by five um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, this is an older camera, so that's all mahogany and, and brass. So this camera weighs 15 pounds. And like I said, by the time you have everything loaded in here, it's more weight. So probably if you got a four by five camera, you're gonna have a lot less weight right off the bat and smaller lenses. And also the filters, if you need any of those filters, are going to be a whole lot cheaper because you get a lot much smaller uh, filter diameter that you have to deal with. So there's a couple of companies you can always buy used, but now there's more and more companies coming online that will, um, it's, it's affordable. There's one in England from, called Intrepid, and I just ran into, an, uh, I've heard of this company, it's, uh, I'm probably going to butcher their name and I apologize ahead of time, it's called Gimbalini, Gambolini, it's an Italian company. If you go to theitaliancamera.com, they have a new 3D printed camera. And that really caught my attention simply because I like the idea of, now the way that they have 3D printed their camera, the way I understand it, it's in a honeycomb shape. So it's very rigid. And with it being a polymer substrate, plastic, however you want to call it, um, I could see that being, and I think for the eight by 10 for that, it's only like seven pounds. So it's be more less than half the weight of this. Cause I eventually I would like to go and take, take us to say out West or to go in the Smoky Mountains and places like that. I don't know how, the other thing is because this is so heavy, now I've got to have a huge tripod. So some of you have seen my Reese tripod and I'll link that down below if you haven't seen that video. That tripod is 25 pounds. So, <laughs> This is 30 and the tripod's another 25. That's why I went up to Old Car City. You saw, probably saw the little blue wagon and I was carting everything simply because there's no way I was gonna be able to cart all this stuff by myself. So going with a lighter camera, you can use a regular tripod that you probably already own with four by five. 
Uh, by the way, the 4x5, uh, I looked it up earlier today from that company, the Italian company, I think is right around, what would we say, two, two pounds, two and a half pounds? So that's very doable. Uh, some of the DSLRs with the bigger lenses are way heavier than that. So I would definitely look at 4x5 as an option if you don't need to print big. Another couple of things to think about with 4x5 is this costs me right now about, um, we'll call it $4 a click from for 8x10 FP4+. Plus. I believe it's about a dollar a click for for 4x5. I'm sorry, did I just say 8x10? Yeah, for 8x10, it's it's $4 for 4x5. I got this crazy bug. We're getting, we're getting to love bug season again. Uh, they're, they're another fun thing about Florida. So yeah, I'm sorry. So, so the 8x10 film for me is $4. 4x5 film from Ilford is um, a dollar a sheet, about a dollar a sheet. Last time I looked it up. And the other thing is if you get the um, development tank from, uh, I was looking at the one from S Stearman Press, I think I believe it's an SP-445. Um, you can get four sheets of four by five in about 500 milliliters of solution and do four sheets all at one time, assuming you don't need to push or pull individual sheets or anything like that. So, you know, if you use, depending on what developer you use, that can only be a couple bucks to, for developer. So that's pretty cheap. Uh, but again, the big thing, oh, the other thing I'm thinking about is um, the scanning. So if, if you're going to do traditional analog prints with enlarger, that's great. But if you're going to want to scan your images and do the hybrid process, that is where something like the V800 from Epson or the V850, I actually got the V800. I didn't see where I needed to spend the extra money for the V850 and I'm doing making prints for galleries and stuff, uh, no problem. So again, I would not buy the 850 myself. But the thing about that particular scanner is it has two lenses in the hood. And the one will do the full 8x10 uh, plate of glass. And that has a good lens in it, but then if you do 35 millimeter 120 or 4 by 5 it uses a different lens on the inside that's narrower and that's the really good lens so um, that's the nice thing about 4 by 5 is you'll have a little bit better image quality than on the scanner side and if you decide you want to wet mount your um, negatives for scanning you can get the scanning uh, kit tray and the fluid and all that stuff for 4 by 5 and again, now you're using a good lens and now you're wet mounting. Some people love wet mounting. Some people say they don't see a difference. I cannot wet mount on mine because the negative takes up the full glass of the, of the uh, scanner. So if I were to try to put that fluid on the scanner, um, I could see it going down around inside and that probably wouldn't work out too well for me. So I, I stay away from that. So basically, if I had it to, uh, to do over again, I would probably still do the 8x10, but I, for, for me, for my big size, I probably wouldn't bought, have bought this camera. I would have, now that there's other options out today that weren't out before, um, I would look at one of those. If you were starting out today, again, if you did not want to uh, make these ginormous sizes, you just, just basically for fun, maybe some 16x20s or 24x36s or something like that, um, then I would definitely look at the 4x5, 3D printed cameras, just to, and they're uh, quite affordable actually compared to what a lot of this stuff costs used on eBay. Again, you can get into cheaper lenses. You can use a regular tripod. Uh, the films, you know, a quarter of the price literally. Um, what else? Oh, I know what else we were going to talk about. The light meter. So, if you're going to get a light meter, don't buy this one. This is way too expensive. This is ridiculous. They just, obviously, when I went in, I mentioned I went to the camera store. They just obviously saw a newbie coming and said, oh, we need to sell him the most expensive thing we can possibly, you know, get him to buy. So, uh, I believe Sekonic has a five, starts with a five, 583. And basically, it doesn't have the Pocket Wizard module built in. It still has the, uh, where you can sight through it. So that one's a whole lot cheaper, and I would buy that used if you could find it. Um, I have seen another Sekonic meter that just incidents, and it's more of a flat design, and it has just the, the bulb on the top here, so like, like so. 
And this is great if you're working, like if I was going to take a picture of this picnic table, I could walk up to it and go click and then get my exposure and away I go. But what if you're out in the Grand Tetons and you want to get, you know, you want to expose for that? That's where something like this is really going to help you that you can uh, do sight through it. But as far as this particular meter, I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend the money on this. Um, it's, it's overkill for what I need. And then when I got started, some people were saying you need to average the highlights and the shadows, and there's a button in here that will do that and it'll calculate the average. To be honest with you, I got more m messed up negatives by doing that than by just citing for the shadows and exposing for that and figuring out the reciprocity if I need to, that reciprocity timer, and away we go. So, and the other development, uh, as far as the developing, I mentioned, uh, if you haven't seen my development video, you can watch that, but I'd use the PyroCat uh, HD. I was using D76, like that. One thing I do like about the PyroCat over the D76 is with the D76, I'd have to calculate the dynamic range of light and then figure, do I need you know N minus one, N minus two, um, through some testing. With the PyroCat, I found I can pretty much throw anything at it and it will hold the highlights, um, which is amazing. So that's the reason why I'm sticking with it is it just makes my life easier being down here in the Florida sun that I can just say, okay, I want to hold the clouds. Um, don't have to worry about, you know, if it's seven or eight stops away, I can, I know that the staining action is going to hold onto it. So it's worked well for me. I can't complain. Uh, try all kinds of things. You'll find whatever's going to work for you. So I think that's about it. So yeah, so again, if I had to do it again uh, for smaller sizes, I'd definitely look at 4x5 and that company that I mentioned. Um, get Use your regular tripod that you might already have. If you don't, you can probably find one maybe at like a Goodwill store or someplace like that or secondhand store, cheap. Just make sure it has that mounting plate on top. And the other thing you're gonna save is weight. Again, big thing is for weight. So other than that, I think well, the rest of it's basically the same so all right well i hope you enjoyed that and i appreciate you watching and we're we've uh, got a lot of subscribers lately so i appreciate each and every one of you taking the time to watch this and go on me with these adventures uh, so if there's things you guys would like to see uh, see me do just please comment down below and uh, if you have any questions as well leave them down there and i will answer each and every one of you i appreciate you watching we'll catch you next time